All right, it is October 1st, 2012, and this is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. Uh, we're continuing our candidates' interviews uh, with independent third-party candidates that are going to be on the ballot this November 6, 2012. Uh, to give you, the public, uh, more information so you know more of your choices and can make a more fully informed decision. And uh, today we have on the phone with us, and uh, who's willing to do this interview, uh, this honest conversation with Martin James Monroe for the 4th District of Iowa. His uh, opponent here is um, Thomas Latham, uh, uh, who's the incumbent Republican um, and also Pete King is the uh, oh Pete King. Pete oh really okay I guess uh, the, yeah, the we were redistricting it to, to Latham's district and he moved into the Des Moines uh, district so he'll be against Boswell I, I believe okay all right uh, great well actually um, thank you very much Martin and uh, um, he uh, that up um, well if you could tell us a little bit about what motivated you. Uh, we got you into the race um, this year, 2012. Um, just a little bit about yourself, sir, and uh, a little bit about your fourth district, please. Okay. Well, um, as a child, I grew up uh, living next door to former Governor Harold Hughes' family. And uh, while I was growing up, my grandmother used to remind me constantly what a great man Harold Hughes was. And that actually inspired me to run for Congress. Um, the fourth district, uh, as most areas in Iowa, is largely agriculture. Um, the southeast district is, is hurting seriously and is having trouble with getting economic development there, as well as some of the other areas in the outlying areas. It seems like Polk County, uh, the capital area of central Iowa, is the only area that seems to really be growing prosperously, uh, with the exception of a few little enclaves here and there. And it doesn't seem like the development dollars are being distributed fairly, in my opinion, in Iowa. And western Iowa, where I live, always seem to get the short end of the stick. And any projects we have for development are, are just sit and linger for 20 years, 25 years before they're accomplished. And uh, so I don't feel we're getting our fair shake out here in western Iowa for certainly. And like I said, the last uh, election, it was... Uh, District 5, which included southeast Iowa, all the way down to the Missouri border, and that's probably the worst hit area for for devastation due to lack of economic, economic development, and plus Iowa has such a huge population leaving the state, and this has been going on for like 50 years. We've lost close to half our population in Iowa over this time, and we really need to figure out what's going on and stop this if we're ever going to get hit Iowa straight again. Wow, uh, that's a big population um, change there, and uh, well, well I, I think it starts with um, you know probably having a good level playing field, a good equal level playing field, and uh, making sure the conditions are all right. And um, yes, yeah, so now I've looked it up. Steve King, um, who was in District Five, but I guess he'll be running District Four, and um, and also Christy Vilsack and uh, the Democrats, and. Um, so that's the, uh, the the choices you'll probably hear on the mainstream, um, uh, Steve or Christy. But um, uh, time's going to come when um, you know the the, rep the polls are going to reflect what we have in Congress right now. The Gallup polls stating that um, there's a 10 percent approval rating in Congress. Um, that's a recent poll, August 24th, and and also it, it matched the historical low which was 10% also, I think it was in March or April. And um, uh, w one, one issue that I always felt was a line in the sand ever since, um, you know, the beginning of this year um, was the National Defense Authorization Act. I mean, there's been a lot of big things that have happened in our the history of our country, the Alien Sedition Act. Um, there's been, um, y you know, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. There's been... Um, different laws that were passed in World War One, the Federal Reserve Act, I mean, just big things. Um, the, the NDAA, I mean, it was kind of a story like, like that, passed uh, or signed um, on December 31st, 2011, and uh, it authorized indefinite detention. It authorized um, a uh, just kind of a, a non-constitutional repression of our civil liberties. Um, uh, by allowing the, the extinction of uh, due process uh, where, you know, they, they feel like they can 
find, find any. It, it also separates um, the military from being able to patrol our streets, which is posse comitatus, getting rid of habeas corpus, knowing your accusers, uh, the the charges against you, having proof, um, having a you know a jury trial, um, a speedy trial, and uh, probably lots of other things. Um, just basically all of due process and. Um, and that was, you know, that passed the House, it passed the Senate, and uh, and someone's got to be held accountable for that, I think. I mean, I know it's attached to a National Defense Authorization Act, you know, and, and we haven't passed a budget in three and a half years. But, I, I mean, um, what do you think about that, um, Martin? Um, what, what do you think about, um, you, you know, that specific bill uh, that, that was just within the last year. Um, do you think that's... Um, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, that's one policy we can do away with. Um, I'm also a little upset that uh, I, I really expected Obama to get rid of the Patriot Act, and that runs right along with the defense appropriations. You know, we're spending so much money on arms, and we're actually producing the weapons of mass destruction, and we accuse other countries of having them, but we're really the king of, of the walk when it comes to producing weapons of mass destruction and a lot of the weapons these other countries have but we help them acquire we help train them and you know now we seem to have a double standard we come back and we're pointing the finger at them and we really ought to be looking in the mirror yeah we sell them all these weapons train them um and uh mm -hmm. And, and, and now, you know, we're fighting them. Um, it's almost as if, um, you know, we're kind of like a bully in a, a play yard s s saying, you know, come on, fight me. Well, here, I'm going to give you some weapons now. You know, just, just hit me or something, you know. Um, and uh, I, that might be one way of looking at it. But um, I, do you think we should be able to, you know, sell our, I mean, you know, I don't know how top secret some of these things are, but it seems like, you know, maybe we shouldn't sell our um F-16s and, and things like that to other countries. Any opinions on that? Well, we're, we're just, uh, it seems like we're feeding the, the military war complex Eisenhower warned us about, you know, and they seem to be more in control of our country these days than we are. And, you know, we spend so much money, like I said again, and we could be spending that money developing America and doing things here. Anytime we provide weapons, advanced weapons to other countries, that only puts us in a position to have to go back to the drawing board and start you know, making weapons to do those. And we're really intimidating the whole world because of us, because of our ambition with, with weapons of mass destruction. We're scaring the hell out of everybody else, and that's why Iran and all these other countries are trying to produce a nuclear bomb, because they're scared. They want to protect themselves against us. They see us as the big enemy. Yeah, I mean, from it's looking... not their neighbors anymore. It's us they're concerned about. Exactly. They see I... us as, as an imperialistic right. force, you know. And we should bring all our troops home. We have no business sticking our nose in the Middle East. Uh, good old Uncle uh, James Monroe had the Monroe document that said we should keep our nose in our own region here. And I agree 100% with that. And we have Russia over there, the Soviet Union, and China. And that's their, that's their backyard. We should let them take care of things over there. Unless they specifically ask for our assistance, if there's some way we can help them as far as terrorism, and this terrorism thing has got way out of hand. they got everybody fearing terrorists, and I just don't see it. You know, I really don't. And terrorism, you know, terrorism isn't, isn't something you can attack. You it's know, a, terrorism is... Yeah, it's a tactic, right? And, um, yeah, it's not a real thing. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's fighting karate or not something. Not like that chair over there is terrorism. That smash that chair and it'll solve our problems. It could be, though. It could be. It's yeah. a concept. Yeah. Terrorism is a concept. How can you how can you go to battle with a concept? Right. Well, if you do, it's got to be through talking and, and dialogue. Certainly, you, you can't shoot weapons at a concept. Terrorism. You can't bomb a concept out of existence. Yeah, I mean, we, we, the way to fight a concept is with, um, you know, by leading a good example and fighting it with other better concepts and, and having friends and um, and uh, putting that heat on, um, you, you know, so having governments that uh, would want to emulate us and, and not have terrorists in their backyards and uh, countries that we're friends with, respect, and can trade with, honestly. And, um, I mean, we don't give subsidies to, like, Britain or we, well, who knows, we might, but, uh, I mean, you know, we don't need to do that to have them be our friends, right? Um, True. And that, that's right where, I'm, where I'm at, Thomas. I'm, I'm trying to set an example. We used to be regarded highly, you know, until more recently here, until we invaded over in Afghanistan and Iraq, 
Oh, we had a total and moral high ground at, right after 9-11. I mean, everyone was we on our side. Yeah. We did. And we should have went in there, got the job done, and got the heck out of there, and we would still have that, that, that high moral ground, like you said. You know, we screwed up by staying in there, and now we've been there longer than we were in Vietnam. Yeah, I think longer than any war ever, um, longer than the Soviets <laughs> probably, um, and uh, another empire. And 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 so yeah, it does like if someone observed, uh, you know, what the happenings of us from outer space, um, just objectively, I mean, maybe we might look like an laughing. empire. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they'd be laughing and going crazy watching us down here. <laughs> look at those idiots! What are they doing? Yeah. They're making nuclear bombs so they can destroy the whole world and, and threaten each other with them. And, you know, we borrow all this money to go to war, but, boy, what, they can't borrow any money to fix our, our infrastructure here in the United States. Yeah, we just build things and destroy them, and instead we could be exploring right. space or something like that. And uh, right. uh, exploring right. the oceans, what, what, whatever. I, I mean, doing a lot more of that. Spending maybe, you know, if, if, if they, you know, if the military... The industrial complex has such a grip, which, which I think, um, you, you know, if we can't defend ourselves against that, then who can are we real, really defending ourselves against? But if they do, or, or if, if there's just not the compromise there, maybe we could just um, uh, avert them, like uh, kind of change their course into um, new technologies, like maybe exploring in space, which uh, and, and also being a, a major, de you, you know, a defense for us. But um, I mean, we could cut back the military um, budget by probably by by lot and that's not something I don't think the Democrats or Republicans are uh, I, it seems like there's a profit motive in war like you're saying with Eisenhower and um, and decisions oh. are being made on fear rather than facts you're right absolutely right they've got everybody scared of everything and everybody's afraid to even stand up for themselves they're so afraid you know and I, I'd like to tell you a story about my experience in the military, they, they waste more money and they're not held accountable. None of the bureaucracies in this country have to be held accountable by an independent, you know, audit at the end of certain periods. Right, especially so, the you know, CIA, the military, I mean, the Defense Department and, and the Federal blank checks. Reserve. Yeah. Blank checks. Oh, they've lost... They can do whatever they want. You know, they can say, we need 350 of these Polaris missiles and there's no debate and then they always cost two or three times as much. They have overruns. Nobody's watching the spending in the Department of Defense. And yet, you're right, the Defense Department spends and wastes so much money, and they've been doing this forever, even during the Cold War, when we were at, actually weren't fiscally at war with anybody, they were still spending money comparable if they were during war times. It never ends. It, we're feeding this industry, literally. Yeah, feeding this industry and waiting for the next war to happen so we're prepared to jump in there. And who makes all the money in the wars? The billionaires. Who pays all the costs? We the people. Who bears all the burden? We the people. And then when we're in a deficit, they want to take away from we the people instead hey. of taking away from those that profited hugely during the last uh, 12 years or so that we've been engaged in this war. A war is a racket. I, I mean, Smelly Butler said that. The general, um, the, 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 I think the Marine general. From, right, man. And, um, I mean, they fund both sides. So it's kind of like they fund both sides with the Republicans and Democrats as well. So, I mean, that's that's another issue. I, I, I mean, um, I'd, and, yeah, it's... Um, it, it's it's pr pr pretty sad. I mean, the military industrial complex um, now has turned into the homeland security complex. And uh, I mean, exactly. if, if we listen to the people um, before 9-11 that were warning us, I mean, the Bush administration was warned a couple times that, you know, people were trying to hijack planes and things like that. Um, and uh, there were FBI um, agents that uh, y you know do have integrity that were trying to warn us um, and uh, and some people were on the case but instead of those people getting promoted uh, most likely they probably got run out or fired and and the people that failed on the job probably are the ones that got promoted and um, and so I mean everything's just backwards I mean we could have you know, arguably, we had the intelligence. I mean, I'm not, I know hindsight's 2020, but um, but I uh, couldn't say it better, Tom. You're absolutely right. We have we have excellent security apparatus in this country prior to this bombing, and people miss warnings. Kind of reminds me of Pearl Harbor. I sit here and I think about it, and how in God's earth 
could Pearl Harbor possibly be snuck up on by so many planes in the air and, and nobody was on guard? You know, it, it just, it just, it just, I can't believe it. Yeah, there's been, um, you know, a lot, you know, now that people can look back on on history and and review those things. I, I mean, that's uh, that's something that's been noted uh, by more recent historians and. Um, and so, who knows how we're going to look back on this? I mean, the Republicans and Democrats um, have a 10% approval rating. If they really had the, uh, the, the, the that affecting affected in, or reflecting Congress, they would actually there should be 10% of uh, Republicans and Democrats in our Congress right now. No, and you know what's happened is these people don't even care about their reputations anymore. They're all gaming the system. They're all making out like bandits. They all have lifetime positions in Congress, just like a king. Uh, it's, it's like they've been self, you know, nominating themselves to Congress for the rest of their life. And they have no right to hold those seats. Those seats are intended to be rapidly turned over. So we have fresh blood coming in and leaving all the time. This prevents corruption. It prevents you from getting too cozy with the big money interest. You know, I'm, I'm really sad. I think Obama, or whoever the next president, it should, should, uh, declare a national emergency employment and homelessness act in this country. We have 47 million people in poverty now in the United States. Uh, we need to invest in our dilapidated infrastructure, education for tomorrow's jobs, uh, with the goal of becoming number one exporters of clean energy and, and complete a transnational solar-powered uh, bullet train across this coast. America needs a national goal to achieve, like the space exploration you related to earlier in the 60s. We need something like that fire this country up and get us going. We need to bring our jobs back. We need to start using trade tariffs to control the offshoring of our jobs and productions, uh, which then are just re-imported back to this country at ungodly cost to American citizens, not to mention the jobs lost and the, and the factories shut down as a result. Now, these are, I mean, issues as an independence that you're not going to hear from a Republican, Democrat, or you might hear, like, one of these things, and... Um, and they're probably, or, you know, are going to find some excuse why they can't, um, y y y you know, get it passed um, or, or fight for it hard enough. And uh, so they always do the opposite of what they promise. I mean, it's it's yep. a vicious cycle, and, and I'm sure that's, I mean, that's why most people don't even vote. But like you said, they don't have any shame. I mean, even if they only won by, only if one person showed out, to, and vote voted for them, and, and it was themselves that voted for themselves. And if they so happen to win, they they wouldn't care. I mean, that wouldn't bring them to shame. They wouldn't feel like, oh, there's a you know one percent turnout this year, and I got elected. Um, you know, maybe just like George W. Bush didn't feel any shame when you know the Supreme Court gave him the election. No, he was strutting around with Cheney like on the ranch, um, like as if he won you know like uh, you know 50 states. Um, so they have no shame. I, I mean, they're gonna get right into it. And, and and um, and and it's going to affect your lives. Uh, so I mean, I, I understand people not wanting to vote, but you don't have to vote for the Republicans or Democrats yet. You can still vote because in 70 percent of the districts there is an alternative uh, candidate um, that's on the ballots, and that you, you know you're in prime position. I, it, it's it, it might be kind of David versus Goliath, but it really is we the people versus special interest, and um, it's it's just a choice. So I mean, you, you're. Uh, um, and, and, you know, they're doing – so we need a lot more transparency. I mean, how can we make – a lot of us don't feel informed or want to get involved in politics, but, you know, maybe some light was shine there. I, I, I mean, um, uh, what, what do you think about freedom of information? Uh, what do you think about whistleblowers? What do you think about um, oversight, hey. accountability, uh, you know, that whole area? Those, those are all leading values in this country that we used to have that we no longer have and they've been taken away from us. Uh, it seems like uh, today in public policy, it, it seems like uh, they don't question, they don't pay attention to questions of purpose and value around the development of the legitimacy and support from the public when they make public policy. Uh, in other words, public servants are looking out for themselves more than the public yeah, and right. often actually in danger 
Everyone from the right the end, public. like, no one wanted those bailouts. I mean, that's why there's Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party. That's one thing that they had in common, and um, yet they pass it anyways. Um, most people don't want to see, like, friends or relatives put in jail for just smoking a joint or, you know, families split up and, um, you know, being put in private prisons, working for slave labor and, and, and things like that, and, and, and yet they, they pass that. I, I mean, most people didn't want the Obamacare. That past. I mean, most people don't want these wars, and, and those are going on. And, um, you know, most people don't want these people who have, we have in Congress. It, it, the, the, there is a way to change it. And um, Thomas Jefferson said, I mean, in order for a democracy to s survive, paraphrasing that, you know, we need a informed and educated public. And um, and right. we're not informed or educated. There's so many backroom deals. Bills have, like, s so much words that it's, it's, it's hard to even go through them or make sense of them. And, um, and there's just so much secret. I mean, people are trying to do Freedom of Information Acts. Journalists are being um, threatened. Um, whistleblowers don't have a way to file grievances or some kind of process that, you know, gives them a fair shake from, um, you know, being persecuted possibly. And um, so, I, I mean, we're walking in the dark here. I mean, I, I don't know all the answers because, you know, a lot of, so if, I, if, they, if the government leaves me to guess, and I just have to, you know, that's where conspiracy theories and stuff come from um, because, uh, you know, everything's not open and transparent. It, it, it invites it. There's nothing more important than openness and transparency. And, and when they, they've been doing away with our regulatory protections now since about 1971. They've all started under Nixon. And each president, regardless of what party they're with, has done further damage in removing regulatory protections and allowing the corporate powers to mass power. Uh, consolidation of power is bad, and our forefathers would have viewed that as akin to being a king. And you can't allow too much power in too few hands. And we need to break the banks down, the insurance companies. There's no reason why a bank should be buying or owning security interests in the insurance industries and other industries. We've allowed, by taking away these uh, protections, we've allowed yeah, these Yeah, that's Glass-Steagall you're grow. referring to, right? Yeah. Glass-Steagall Act, absolutely. And pretty much all of FDR's, uh, you know, uh, regulatory protections were done for good purposes. He actually figured out, you know, after seeing the Great Depression before, he actually figured that it was actually the banks and Wall Street and, and big money changers who were actually responsible for creating the situation in the whole world that led us to the world wars. It was poverty, the massive poverty like we're starting to get right now, and that's got me concerned that they're setting us up for World War Three here, which would be a bad deal with all the well, that's uh, the, the kind of uh, just kind of like uh, you know dark places and, and moisture. You, you, well, in some times <laughs> can, can can make mold. This kind of environment can make um, uh, like a, you know like a Hitler kind of atmosphere. You know, or a Mussolini yeah, type. Of my mind. I just wish watched a documentary on the rise of Hitler. And I got God, it's so scary how it resembles a lot of things happening when today. When people get desperate, basically, yeah, and uh, and, and yeah. angry, and uh, and when they have families that they need to feed, um, and right. uh, they have nowhere to feed them, they can get really, really desperate. Um, you know, when, when when they have loved ones that they, you know, instinctively need to take care of. Um, you, you know, uh, we don't need to get that desperate. I I would say. I mean, we need to. Um, well, every two years, uh, you know, the House of Representatives can be re elected on. It's kind of like an emergency break that's why we are able to do that every two years um i mean we do need more oversight and uh more um uh transparency but at the same time i mean some of the answers are right here already we just need to sometimes use what we already have and uh that's the power of uh you know, participating and yeah, just voting basically and informed and 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 realizing you know we need to trust bust this Republican and Democrat um, monopoly and it's just like everything else like you know they always call the Patriot Act the Patriot Act it's it's very unpatriotic um, the Democrats are anything but democratic the Republicans are anything but uh, you know representing a republic and um, neither of them represent the values they once were established under. Yeah, I mean, their platforms are just there as, like, uh, you know, almost just like uh, napkins to wipe their mouths with or something like that. And um, right. uh, so, 
so we do. I mean, these are fundamental issues. The issues we're talking about, you know, aren't, we are talking about infrastructure and, and investing in America and, and some particulars. But I, I, I feel like we're we're talking about these foundational issues, and it's at a point where we have to. I, I mean, maybe in the eighties right, or they're the nineties. They're 90s. breaking down the foundations of our constitution and our whole existence, and if we don't stop them, they will continue. Yeah, foundations are because they're involved in the continue as long as they're having successes. They're not going to stop. I mean, if everything was great and we had a balanced budget, like maybe we could talk about the particulars uh, of this and that, or in a more like, you, you know, things like um, whether baseball players are, uh, you, you know, doing steroids or whatever. But I mean, that's not, you know, if, uh, that's you, we can discuss those issues when times are good and things are happy um, and, and everyone's doing all right and there's like a two percent unemployment rate or whatever. But I mean. Times aren't like that now, and, 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 you know, we can't be wasting our time talking about, you know, baseball players and, and things like that. Um, you, you oh, yeah, know. These, edge, these wedge issues just don't make it right now because our, our government is fundamentally screwed up and, and it's, un, it's dysfunctional, totally dysfunctional. So I had somebody say, what do you think about this issue or what do you think about that issue? I said, you know, I'm not even thinking about issues of selection cycle. It's about fixing Congress, getting Congress working again, because if we don't get Congress fixed and working again, none of these issues matter because they're never going to make it to the floor for any kind of real serious debate anyway. Yeah. We need to figure out how us, we the people have a right to participate in government. So my question is, is how do we do that? This Congress will not allow us to, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, things are so screwed up right now, we should have citizen panels on every bureaucratic meeting where they're formulating policy for public policy in this country. Oh, yeah, I mean, if the federal reserve these people because yeah. the regulators aren't getting it done. Oh, you're, I mean, they, they pass laws without uh, Congress's approval. Um, it's it's the Federal Reserve who has a bigger budget than the whole Congress, who's supposed to have the power of the purse. It's the president who's declaring wars right now. I mean, it's out of control. I mean, and, and, and no one's claiming the responsibility for what they need. We need people who want to be there and want to do the work and yeah, want to uh, read the bills and, uh, and want to do their job. And right. we need to get these people a real job. Most of them, I mean, if you look across the country, I've looked through, like, so many um, candidates' biographies, um, I mean, most of them hardly has ever had a real job, ever. I mean, some of them maybe a couple years or something as a staff member of some other congressman. Congressperson, right. and I mean <laughs> these people. They're, 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 you're right. They're they're like um, nobility, and uh, you, you know they're sirs, ma'ams. Um, they're honorable. They're uh, they're just um, you know out of touch. They're like from another planet or something. I, I mean they, you know they they just um, don't relate. They're out of touch. Uh, it's like it goes through. The, they don't have the ability to um, to think, or, or or either that, or they're just really shutting it off oh, yeah. really well. I jokingly. I jokingly tell people, I think it's um, things like all the sociopaths have been elected to Congress, and the rest of us have been let out. Well, there have been psycho, I mean, there have been tests. I mean, by psychologists that that have um, put put uh, most politicians in that uh, category, at least uh, nowadays, what we know as politicians. I mean, it really is. People don't want to get involved in politics, but it's really just about psychology. It's about people. It's just about um, interacting with others. Just like you go to a grocery store, you know, you don't want someone coming up to you and pushing you or whatever. Or, or like if you had. The, took the last bag of chips, you wouldn't want someone just taking that out of your shopping cart. I mean, that's what politics is. It's just how we interact politics with other is people. Politics study of people. Yeah. It's, that's what it is, a study of people, so you can uh, generate policy that uh, works best for the people. That's the whole purpose of our government. And people are cutting down government. We need smaller government, and then they, then they create homeland security, yeah. a massive new bureaucracy. Yeah, you thanks know, so to they, George They say one thing on one hand but they do the opposite on the other hand. And a lot of their political foes, or allies, got jobs there with Homeland Security, or favoritism jobs created for these people that worked on their campaigns to do their dirty Oh, yeah. Deal. There's a lot of special no-bid contracts going on there from the X-ray scanners to, you know, now they want to um, X-ray scan people on the highways and, and things like that. And uh, that's not, um, you know, representative of free society. It seems like the eye's always on us. Like, wherever we go, there's that black, um, y y you know, camera <laughs> looking at us. And uh, I'm, I'm waiting for a drone to hoover over my house right now and listen in on our conversation here. Right, but what... <laughs> It should be Gary, man, opposite. Really we we should we need it should be I mean in a real democratic republic where people are you know it's the home of the brave and um, and free uh, land land of the free where we um, 
you know, we should have the cameras on them. I mean, anyone, everyone that's working, you know, they should be treated, you know, fair. They shouldn't have their homes or their private times uh, video cameraed, of course not. I'm not saying that. But while they're on the job, you know, whether it's in Congress on C-SPAN um, or, or police officers or whoever, and, and they should be proud to be on the camera. They should think of it as protecting them and protecting um, whoever they're interacting with. And, uh, uh, I mean, they should be on camera, you, you know, all the time, you, you know, and... Um, uh, and and so it, it, it's it, and, and everything should be documented, accounted for. I mean that's what the Congre I mean the Constitution um, demands is that every single penny is accounted for, and there's you know a lot of black budgets going on too. Um, you know I mean it's CIA selling drugs, so it has a black uh, budget. Um, I, I've heard, um, but of course that can't be verified. Um, so that's just more innuendo because uh, we don't we're not able to f you know find all the facts so it just leaves those kind of questions out there and um and so uh and, and there are good people in there and, and those are the people that should be promoted i mean sometimes i see someone resign in um uh, as a protest i almost wish i'm glad they do and they usually write a book or whatever but uh, maybe they should stay in there and, and, and wait till they get fired and, and just, you know, call people out and, um, and, and demand that the other people, you know, quit. Uh, but um, well, if these people really had honor, they would just they would just resign and leave Congress if they've been in there for over 20 years. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if I felt so pressured where I couldn't vote, you know, on bills, my conscience, I think at least I wouldn't want to do any damage and, and just leave, you know, at the very least. Um, and... Uh, so, um, well, what about um, uh, abortion and, and the drug war? Um, you know, two issues. Where um, you know, the drug, drug war is a joke. I guess we didn't learn from prohibition. Uh, they say history repeats itself. And it yeah. seems like the drug war, you know, you never hear anything about heroin or, or morphine or any, any, you know, cocaine. It's always marijuana. It's like the, drug, the war on drug is transferred to marijuana. And what I see going on here is we have a lot of privatized uh, prisons, and they're for-profit prisons, so they're just like a corporation. Their their goal is to maximize profits, a trade a lot the of any liabilities, yeah. and pass the buck on to people for any of their expenses. And they want to they want to fill all those bets just like a motel does. And how best to do that? You got all these billions, hundreds of billions of dollars being wasted on this on this stupid drug war. And the best. There's more people smoking marijuana right now than any other drug, so that's the biggest pool that these guys can pull people in and throw them in prison and occupy these beds. In my opinion, we need to decriminalize marijuana. It's a joke that, that, that marijuana is at the, the position it is in the criminal justice system. Um, and it's all about money. People are making big bucks off the marijuana industry. Well, we do have the highest incarceration rate, and a lot of that is impacted by um, just marijuana, actually, believe it or not. A lot of people think it's right. more than that. Some of it is, but... A you know, they have a, a prison over in uh, South Dakota. I think it's in Yankton. And they have no fences. People just dress in ordinary... It's for people for non nonviolent crimes, like marijuana. Or victimless crimes, and even more so, yeah. I mean, whether it's... Right, and it's, it's more geared towards counseling and letting them out and putting them on probation. And you can walk off the premises anytime you want, but the, the, the sticker is you're going to serve your full time in prison if you do. So they give them an option to go to this, uh, you know, minimum security prison. Like I said, there's not even fences around. You're on, you're on, you're on your honor system, and, you know, you don't leave or you serve your full time. It's just and kind of like a dentist. So you know, much money. Yeah. It's like a dentist making, or, or a doctor, I should say, make gig, gig, gig doing an extra procedure because they know the insurance is going to pay them off, you know, and it's like, exactly. yeah, I mean, it's yeah, just exactly. a free check, and, um, and in the meanwhile, that person could have a kid that's like, you know, in elementary school or something right now, that person could have a wife or, or husband, and, um, you know, who's, you know, having a hard time paying the mortgage right now, and, um, and who misses, you know, their, uh, their loved ones, and, um, you know, they could have a parent and brothers and sisters who, like, you know, on their birthday usually, you know, go over to their house and blow out the candles on the cake but instead you know they're just you, you know whether they're in south dakota or wherever they're not free um you, you know and uh they're in captivity for a victimless you know uh, offense um and uh to me that's just sad and, and it's just got to be stopped it's got to be stopped well, and, it's, it's a criminal market is what it is and uh, since more you know they say up, there's up to 50 percent of all the federal prisoner inmates are there for marijuana 
usage. In America, a doctor can write you a prescription for synthetic heroin, yeah. synthetic opium, cocaine, the numerous barbiturates. Well, there are some people but still they can't getting... write you a script for marijuana. There, there is like um, there's this guy in the 80s that got a prescription for marijuana from the government, and he gets it from the federal government. It was a sh- trial, but the people who were still getting it can still get it, and he still does. And um, you can see him on, like, the Internet on, like, some videos explaining this. And so he was saying he feels guilty that the government is locking up people for the same thing that they give to him for his uh, med- med- medication. Right, right. And marijuana does work for a lot of people, cancer patients, with people with glaucoma, it's proven. And there's no, no, no serious harm has ever been proved about marijuana. There uh, sure been, they get some, yeah, there's they get some pseudo uh, scientists to come in and, and make misclaims. All right, and you there's know, to, been cancer patients, seventy year olds, um, at least seventy, I think maybe they're eighty, but I mean thrown in jail um, for that, you know, dying of can- or you know living with cancer and uh, and trying to deal with it and and having their you know house busted in. I mean, I don't know what they were in the middle of, but whatever they're in the middle of, you know, their doors are busted in and uh, and they're put in jail. Um, and, and uh, it's so ridiculous that even the Indian Indian uh, reservations can't grow it for making hemp and rope and using it for all the old. Uh, do you uh, think? I mean, would people, farmers, want to grow it if the hemp? I mean, I'm just talking about industrial hemp for a second. Would would that right. be a benefit? To, like, do you think a lot of farmers? It want would, but it, you know what? It would also be competition against the cotton growers and all the big corn cold money. Yeah. You know, corn growers, and you know, so you you keep running into these massive lobbying organizations they have so much money that hey, you can't beat them back now if you make it in the free market if you make it with a competition then all power to you if you make it you become a billionaire like bill gates and you don't try to stifle competition then that's great right but if you right. start doing things that like um you, you know you pay congress to pass laws that make it illegal for your competitors to you know bring on other products to the markets then that's cronyism, and um, I mean, what do you think this, uh, there's a lot it's of... It's illegal, it's unconstitutional, it's, it's a violation of ethics for a member of Congress, but you know, when's the last time you heard or seen an ethics violation, complaint or anything in, in Congress? No, I haven't I, seen one in like 10 years since I recall I have heard a anybody lot of being con- pulled up. Congress people that they're they you know they use their spouses to to open up like a uh, nonprofit in their name and then they funnel money through that way and then there's revolving doors between big industries and these uh, regulatory departments and um, I've seen a lot of that going on and um, and and hearing about that in the news and uh, it's it's very blatant and it's almost like they they actually try to make excuses for it saying you know trying to argue that. That uh, a clear conflict of interest is actually, um, you know, somehow on on the up and up, and uh, and it, it, you know that's pretty sad too. That you you know they they could even try to make that argument or not have any kind of standards. And um, so, uh, what about abortion? Um, you know, where do you stand on abortion, gay marriage? Um, uh, you know, those two topics. Well, I hate to go with the, the wedge issues because these things have all been argued for 35 years since I got out of high school in 1977. Congress hasn't had the courage to bring them to debate on the floor of Congress where they all belong. That's where we should be talking about them. Uh, the people of this country need to be able to enter into dialogue extensively on these issues because these are the hot-button issues that really incite people the most. Well, well how come they're not coming to the floor? Well, Congress wants to keep their jobs so bad. And these are issues where 50% of the population support and 50% don't. So they see it as a no-win situation. No matter which way they go, 50% of the population is going to be against them. Well, that goes so they against... see that as a threat to their job. Yeah, that's you the know, same thing of uh, freedom of information and, and, and intelligence. I mean, I, I think we should can, you know, face all these issues and you know, debate them and, and et cetera. Yeah. Well, we both know how Congress is supposed to function in regards to the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court makes a ruling, Congress takes it back up again to decide if they agree with the ruling. And if they don't, they basically tell the Supreme Court, we don't agree with you. Or they can get a supermajority vote, or they can change or alter the bill so that it will comply with the, the, with the Supreme Court's decision. I know it's a tough issue. But what I, we've done, yeah. Roe versus Wade was basically a law made by the Supreme Court. It's never went before the floor in Congress like it should have been. Right. I, don't, I don't support abortion, and 
And regardless of whether I support any of these issues or not, I believe they all belong on the floor of Congress for an open debate with the people and but, need to be put to rest. Now, I, 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 I don't, you know, support abortion either. I, but I do, do think, like, you know, th- there is a danger of going back to back street alleys and, and things like that, you know. And, right. and we don't want to do that. And I don't think, you know, I, I don't know if I'd want to, you know, prosecute uh, what what woman doing doing that and um and I, I think you know there's ways to try to reduce it and and education and uh but um you know especially and, and there are you know certain uh, different situations too like uh, rape and you know uh, life right there's always there's always circumstances to any uh, any issue or incidents in life and you can't just throw everything in one basket and, and pass a, a law for everything I mean it really takes a judge and like the minimum sentencing that we have, everybody goes to prison for 25 years, third, third time offender is a joke. It, it takes it takes the law out of the judge's hand. The judges are the ones that need to weigh in on this and decide, you know, what's the proper course or how many years each person uh, should be sentenced to. Because right now, I mean, and, pretty much the status quo is no federal taxes to it, um, but, um, you know, pretty much, you know, they, they, you know, seem to have the rights right now, but... Um, uh, and 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 the the marriage issue. I think the government should just get out of marriage completely. I think that would be a good answer, um, to be quite honest. But um, people... well, the federal government should have no business in this matter. It's really a state to state issue on marriage. Now, when it comes to being married in the church, I think the church should have the final say there. Certainly, well, yeah, um, they should be forced to church. do something that's against against them but as far as going into a uh, to a mayor's office or you know civil marriage um, that's a state to state issue but I think now, people should it, be treated equally under the law too so I mean so right right one thing way Absolutely. They, yeah so uh, I, mean, I, I heard a statistic yesterday that the, the Hispanic population is growing in America by like 14 point so many percent and the Caucasian population uh, it's only grown by 1%. So we are literally aborting ourselves into minority status in our own country. And it's uh, if, if you look at it for no other reason, that's something to consider. Well, I think, you know, they, yeah, I, I mean, well, people, uh, uh, that's that's one way. I mean, I don't think people are, you know, most one want to get an abortion, you know. Um, I don't either. Yeah, so... Yeah, I, I mean that'd be hard to, to, you know, think, but um, but you know, for like life and 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 especially like rape and stuff like that, I can. Um, there's that. I'll, I'll, I'll go one step further. I'll bet there's nobody in the United States Congress who's having anybody in their family having an abortion, but they don't have the courage to stand up one way or the other. Yeah, it's. And, uh, and I do have an issue like you do with rape. I mean, how can you expect a woman to raise a child that might look like the rapist? Right. Yeah. I mean, often, you know, the boy looks just like Dad. But I can understand... And if Dad is a rapist, you're forcing this woman to never be able to put this in her past and get on with her life. Right, and then so have every to... every time she looks at that child, she's reminded of the guy that raped her. And this is something that, like I said, there's considerations in, in everything in life that we have to look at and consider. And there's considerations there's in the trimester as well. I mean, you know, if they're just about to give birth, I think that might be, you know, too late for an abortion or whatever, you know, so... Right, um, right. So no, there definitely should be some some point set at, at you know, like when the, actually the child is fully formed and has a heartbeat. After that point, you shouldn't be allowed to get an abortion unless it's a danger to the woman's life. Now, and if you rape, you know, you certainly ought to be going to the doctor or considering this before it gets to that point. You know. Now another hot topic I think is like just labels like libertarian, progressive, um, capitalist, uh, socialist, um, statist. Uh, you know, and I could probably just go on and on and on, and um, uh, demographics, basically, um, and et cetera. Um, what, but, you know, from what I'm hearing about you, I'm hearing a little bit of, um, you know, just kind of a, an Americanism um, and a constitutionalism and a, uh, uh, I mean, so just, I don't know exactly how to frame this question, but I threw all those kind of labels out there. Um, like I don't really have right? a title, do I? <laughs> well, what, 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 what? I just call myself No Party Marty. <laughs> there, you <go. laughs> there you go. I don't really have a title. I really don't fit, you know, comfortably under under your traditional labels. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, you feel know, like you lean one way, way or another, or, or I mean, you, you know, just just kind of exploring yeah. this topic here a little bit. So, yeah. 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 I, I explore, listen to what everybody says, and I, you know, I often ponder and wonder what what our forefathers. Try to envision our forefathers in the room with me, and what would they say? 
I have this thought that issue. too. Like you know what would happen if the forefathers came back, and if they had to wear like a disguise, you know, but they would went on the debates, right. you know, if they had like a reality show where we brought these people back and they agreed to it after we explained it to them and you know after their shock value, and then we put on these uh, disguises so they like one forefather would be on the Democrat debate, one on the Republican debates, and um, they'd probably get booed off the stage. They would probably get booed right off the stage. Uh, our forefathers would be very disappointed in what's going on with our government today. Yeah. Uh, they probably would be in total disbelief, actually. Actually, I, I well, a lot of people were cheering um, Ron Paul and stuff, so maybe they wouldn't have been, you, you know. Um, but I think the media and, and, and the, the powers that be would be, you know, kind of trying to nudge them off. And, you know, I wonder if we presented the Constitution to the Congress right now, and if they had a vote on it. Um, and uh, and make that the law of the land if they would even vote for it. Right, right. Who knows? <laughs> Probably not. Well, now talking about that a little bit, um, like the founding fathers, and it doesn't have to be from that time period or, or anything. It could be right now. Like, who's some people that you've been thinking about lately? Um, and 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 why is that, Martin? You mean regarding our forefathers? Well, just anyone. It could be someone you, you know that no one's even heard of, um, but just uh, just just lately, I guess, is the main thing. Uh, so Justice uh, Lewis Brandeis, somebody I, that I look up to. I loved Robert Kennedy's work in poverty, going into the uh, the African American neighborhoods and really just letting people thrash him and scream at him and and tear him down, and I think that's that's the ideal representative there. You need to be able to step into other people's shoes and hear their concerns, you know. And it's, I read a book, uh, Trotsky, about a, a Russian author that was sent to the, to the gulags uh, for being an artist, and when he died, he had an inscription under uh, his bench, I believe, in his cell, and it says, how do you expect those who are not hungry to understand those who are? Yeah, that's, I mean, um, we, we, we can't really, and, and uh, that's why we can elect our own representatives, and how can we expect people who have never had a real job to know what it's like to have a real job? And, um, and uh, or, yeah. or people who, I, I, I have people, you know, who've been blessed and never been without a job in their entire life, and they just can't fan them why people are struggling to find work. They just don't get it because they've never experienced it in their entire life. And they and they don't realize how fortunate they are either. Yeah, a lot of times people they act, have they act to like they're better than the rest of us or something or they're, you know, they were born under, a, you know, a guiding light or something, and the rest of us weren't. Yeah, or, if, or, you know, if I had gotten, you know, hit by lightning, which, you know, I'll knock on wood here, but, I mean, then, you know, you might understand why I might flinch a little bit, like, you know, if we're outside and it was, like, lightning out, you know, and we're in a... Right. I, I mean, it, it, I, my, my, my reactions might be a lot different than, um, than, than, than other normal people, and um, so... Um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of things uh, like like that, and uh, so I mean, we can try. There are people that try to be empathetic, and like you said, I was looking. It was funny you said that. I was, I was kind of looking at some old clips of Robert Kennedy um, the other day, and um, and I saw a debate with him and, and Reagan, or a little bit of that, and then another. And, and he did go out there. I mean, I think that's you know you, sh you should go also. You should go to who your base is, but I think um, you should also go out there um, r right right right. In in the middle of the, uh, you know, downtown or wherever um, you need to go and to, to everybody because whether it's, um, you know, a thousand votes from one district, no matter where they're at, I mean, hopefully everyone wants to, uh, you know, vote for the Constitution and um, so, right. yeah, I, I mean so, as, a, yeah. as a film organizer, I've gone into African American neighborhoods, the hood I've gone into barrios and, you know, I, I've gone into you know neighborhoods that nobody else wanted to go into or were afraid to go into and I had nothing but great experiences uh, the whole time through not saying that you can't you know in fact I in an African American neighborhood I I, I, I approached a group of guys and one of them was ready to, to duke it out with me and all of a sudden one of the other guys said oh hold on man he said, I want to hear what the man's got to say he's a white boy coming in here and marching right up to us he says I want to hear what this guy's got to say and I was really impressed that he stood up for me and stepped in. 
uh, you know. And uh, so I gave him my, my spill and told him I was working for my state representative. And uh, the, they were trying to get rid of him. His own party was trying to get rid of him. And I thought he was a good man. He's done a lot of good for your neighborhood. And if you want to see him get reelected, you need to step out and vote. And it was the worst voting district in the state with only 17% showing up for the primary. Mm. We delivered 68% for the primary. Wow. Which is absolutely unheard of even for a general. Even Kennedy didn't do that well in the general election. Well, and uh, just two of us, me and my state representative, they redistricted, so he worked his new district, and I worked his old district, which was the Italian and and the African-American neighborhoods around uh, downtown Des Moines and all the minority neighborhoods. And that was the reason his own party was trying to get rid of him because he didn't vote on a lot of the bills because they didn't do nothing for his neighborhoods. You know, they did good things for all the wealthier neighborhoods, but, you know, they didn't want to, they didn't want to distribute any of that uh, part of the wealth uh, to the minority neighborhoods. And so he just simply withheld his vote and didn't vote. Well, I, I mean, that sounds great. That's inspiring, and I like to hear that. That's um, the kind of American spirit that's uh, really, I think, um, you, you know, will help heal this country and, and let us regroup and, uh, uh, you know, make this November a November to remember. If, if, if we, you know, this is about, you know, I'm just focusing really on the Congress here. and You know, I know there's a lot of presidential politics also going on um, and um, and there are more than two choices there as well but uh, I mean this is where we can to me the path of out of all this mess that we've been talking about the path of least resistance to um, to, to freedom uh, and, and truth to travel is through the Congress because we can directly affect it every two years and um, and, and it's not such a hot topic and um, it's more localized to the districts um, no matter if you're in the fourth district of Iowa or not, I would, Martin, I, I think you're speaking to America here, um, and uh, I think people, you, you know, would want to uh, take a look at Martin Monroe, M-A-R-T-I-N-M-O-N-R-O-E dot com, and, um, and uh, you know, consider that even if they're not in your district, they're going to be, repre you know, in some ways, as far as the federal things go, uh, be, you know, a, a voice that um, you might want representing you as well. We don't have to, you know, play by these, um, like, you know, de you know, I have to vote for Democrat or Republican rules. I mean, they don't, they're not obliged to us in any way whatsoever. I mean, that's that's not any obligation that we have um, uh, what, whatsoever. We should uh, participate in those parties if you feel like you want to change it. But at the same time, um, change it. Go ahead and do that. But at the same time, like what we're talking, 2012, like Gary Johnson has said, be libertarian with me just this one year because this is, um, we're at a crucial point. And I mean, I'm just saying, you know, just vote independent and third party this one year and see how it goes. Maybe we could get 50 plus independent third party candidates elected, um, you know, representing each state. Maybe we can get more, less, I mean, as many as we can. I mean, that's that will change the dynamic. And um, so, uh, you know, the, I mean, the, the, the main thing is, uh, are you going to uphold your oath? And, um, it, you know, do you believe in equal justice under the law and, 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 and want to work with people and, um, and be truthful and, uh, y you know, just kind of bring that American spirit back where, you know, you're not... Um, uh, necessarily a Democrat or Republican. I mean, you can see beyond that, just trying to find the best ideas that work, bringing solutions instead of more problems to problems. And Martin, is there anything else that we didn't quite go over yet that you'd like to cover? Um, uh, and uh, to, and I do appreciate your time so far today, sir. No, uh, it sounds like you're right on the ball. I agree with uh, quite a bit of what you said. Probably most of it, actually. And I think the most important thing we can do right now in all politicians is put our people back to work and protect our protect our industry from offshoring. And we need to invest to get this country moving again. We can't. We're not going to do it. I realize we have a big debt, but unfortunately, and when we invest, we should look at it as an opportunity because we can make money putting people to work. They're going to pay taxes. The money's going to be coming back into the coffers at the same time. And so if we do this smartly, we should be able to come out ahead and make money to help pay down that debt. Oh, totally. Uh, but, you I, know, I, we're never going to deal with a zero interest rate, giving the fat cats money for free, and then they don't turn around and loan it to people that want to start up business adventures or, or anything, you know. They're just 
Now, we're, the money. we're not going to do, you know, succeed by giving bailouts to the people who failed at, at the expense of their own competitors. And, um, I mean, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. I mean, w the, the way we're acting, I mean, we have to wonder what the end goal is here. Um, and so I know what I want the end goal to be is uh, peace, prosperity, the Constitution, constitutional rights, etc., natural rights. And I, 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 I agree. I mean, it, it's like when I'm deciding who to vote for, I research someone in depth. I go to a website, look at all their issues, I see who all their competitors are, watch the debates, um, find any articles on them, their history, their biography, etc. And, um, and what I'm seeing here, and with a lot of candidates that are running, there are a lot of people who are actually a lot of veterans this year, uh, Martin, like, like you said you were, and, um, and a lot of people that are going to take their oath seriously. I mean, do I have to agree on every issue? I don't want to agree on every issue. I mean, in, in, in some sense, I want to agree on most of them. Um, the most important ones that have to do with the, you know, Constitution. And, uh, you know, I see, you know, what's someone going to stand up to? Like, what kind of backbone are they going to have? I mean, are they just playing around issues? Or, you know, are they bold enough to um, acknowledge that um, we have, uh, you know, a messed up system that needs to be completely fixed, like the drug war, like our empire, um, our imperialism, and, uh, you know, I see what kind of integrity they have, what kind of jobs they've had, you know, the military, that's definitely good, someone who, you know, when, when they talk about America and the Constitution, you could tell that, um, you know, they revere it very much, and, um, and so, and that's not what I see with Republicans and Democrats, these are not the issues that they're talking about, um, and, uh, or, or reflecting whatsoever. I mean, what I see from them is a greedy, you know, sly uh, shikesters that just want to, um, you know, uh, smooth talk people and, and, and really just, you know, just it's, it's get us like more It's like the mafia's taking over Congress, you know, and it's, it's like a bunch of mafioso guys, you know. They're all connected by and judges and representatives and Supreme yeah. Court. They, you know, whatever they need, they got the money to buy anything. They buy the media. And we, we screwed up yeah. by allowing them to get that big. And now we need to chop them back down. That's the only way we're going to do it. Yeah, I think chop MSNBC them down, is... regulate them. Yep, MSNBC is owned by you know General Electric. I mean, they they they, they it, it is an inside game, and um, and it's totally rigged. And there's you know insiders everywhere, and uh, and uh, you know the Republicans and Democrats, you know, just by voting for them doesn't mean that you're in now. It, it, it's you're just the you know the pawns that support them and give them the money. And uh, you know, yeah, Chuck Grassley came back for his last vacation here in my hometown of Ivy Grove, and that with a bunch of Republicans, and they, they ask him a lot of great questions. How come we don't have term limits? How come we don't have public financing of the elections? You know, and uh, he just sidestepped them on everything they asked him. They asked a lot of great questions that deserved a response. And I couldn't even get the local paper. I told them I, that I wanted to speak to that, and they won't even, they won't even interview me. And, and this is why I'm a third party. I'm going to talk about things that the two big parties don't want to discuss. I'm going to talk about the real issues, and I'm going to mess their game plan up. And it's like Jesse Ventura says, he says, we're not going to see third-party representatives get elected until they're allowed to debate openly with these other two candidates on the open stage. Well, they've already taken their debate if they refuse to do it. What they're doing is giving you the fifth, and um, and we can, and, and, and they're not even in court. I mean, they're just debating, for, you know, giving freedom of information to you, the electric, so you can make a fully informed choice. And if they're, um, you know, hiding from that, I mean, they're hiding from their own cells, their own records, their own ideas. I mean, they're not That's the cool. caliber of person that uh, you want representing you. I want a real American representing me and um, someone who's not, uh, you know, timid or, um, or incompetent um, and, uh, it, you, you know, and, and, and bordering on, um, you, you know, what's worse than incompetency. But, yeah, go ahead. Well, I see career politicians uh, as the equivalent of kings. They don't honor democratic values or religious morals, only money and power, and they feel entitled to hold office for life just like a king. Yeah, and I'm really disturbed at the way our Congress is, is running these days. And the Patriot Act, the National Defense Authorization Act, and the FISA laws, uh, we need to get rid of all these. Uh, these are only should be used when we've actually been invaded by a foreign force. Like we did the Civil War, we, we had to use some of these. But, you know, we don't need these programs right now. It's just feeding the, the industrial war complex with, un, with undue profits they don't deserve. Yeah, we, need to we need to focus our... on restoring our own democracy here 
and building our own infrastructure instead of other countries. Yeah, we don't have to defend their tactics. We can, you know, propose, um, uh, you know, ours, and uh, y you know, so um, yeah, basically, uh, the, you know, they, we don't have to play into their game. In other words, it's it's rigged. We don't, you know, we don't have to participate in that game. I mean, let's be higher than that, and uh, y you know, move forward and. Um, so, excellent. Well, Martin, it's been great talking with you. And again, it's martinmonroe.com, um, District 4 in Iowa. And uh, it's been a pleasure, sir. And, um, uh, you know, Godspeed, uh, November 6, 2012. Um, hopefully for the whole United States uh, or many places, it'll be shot, uh, shot heard around the world. And, um, and the headlines. That's what we need. That's what we need. Uh, and so, we need Paul well, Revere to mount that horse and take another ride, huh? <laughs> well, we, we, we do, we do, and, um, and uh, you know, we, we can, um, you know, vote, and uh, so I, I, I agree, and I'll say goodbye to you real quick after this interview, and thanks again, Martin. Yeah, great day, Thomas. Thank you very much for allowing me to talk to you and, and tell you my position on things. I appreciate it. Thanks, sir.